Welcome everyone to the uh, uh, 31st uh, um, advanced school in economic theory. Um, I know that uh, uh, last year when I greeted you, when Eric gave his papers, I was saying- um, It's like if you're speaking, uh, we can't hear you. Can you At hear me now? At least I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I Eric? can hear you, it's Hawk. Um, okay, so- Eric? Eric? Eric, are you hearing? Eric? Can you hear us? Mm. <laughs> uh, Let's make a try, perhaps. Uh, Sergio, are you hearing us? Yes. Okay. Ben in the States, are you hearing us? <laughs> yes, good. Yes. Okay. No, I, can, I can hear now also. Can you, can you hear us now? Excellent, good. So I'll, I'll start over again. Okay, sorry. Uh, um, welcome to the uh, 31st uh, uh, Jerusalem Advanced School in Economic Theory. Um, it's really good to see you all, uh, I'll bite on Zoom. And last year when I greeted you and said next year in Jerusalem, I didn't realize that we'll have another year of pandemic. Uh, but um, I'm going to repeat myself and say next year, truly in Jerusalem, we hope to see you all gathering here and maybe discussing the post COVID-19 economics and uh, not the one that you are supposed to discuss uh, this time. So all I have to say is that welcome to the Israel Institute for Advanced Studies and I wish you a, a very successful and I'm sure fruitful uh, um, advanced school. And uh, Elchanan, the floor is yours. Thanks, Itzik. Uh, welcome everybody. Good afternoon to our audience here and good morning to our speakers and audience in the States. Uh, first, I want to thank Eric for uh, preparing for us once again, a beautiful program, even though it's going to be on Zoom. And uh, I'd like to thank the speakers for putting the time and effort uh, to make this happen. Um, just one procedural comment. Since uh, we are a rather large audience, uh, questions will be handled by chat. So if you have a question, please send it by chat to me or to the, all the audience, and I'll try to bring it up. I apologize in advance for the fact that some, some questions uh, might be deferred to the end. And if there are many questions, not all of them will be, it, it will not be possible to address all of them, uh, but I'll do my best uh, to bring up as many questions as possible. Um, so thanks again for joining us and participating in this uh, exciting event. And uh, Eric, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Well, let me first put up my slides. Well, I, I'd, I'd first like to say uh, how happy I am that we can meet at all un, under the circumstances. And, and many thanks to the IIAS for making these uh, emergency arrangements. Uh, we did it last year. It, 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 uh, it seemed to work pretty well. And uh, with any luck, it'll work even better this year. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the, the speakers who who you'll be hearing uh, over the next few days. Uh, uh, all of them have been thinking about these issues for quite some time, Mo most of them actually well before the pandemic actually started. And uh, you, you may have seen uh, their public writings uh, on, on the matter. Uh, some of them have been writing op-eds, advising governments, and so on. So you'll, you'll be getting, uh, I, I, unlike most summer schools, you'll be getting uh, information which is extremely timely. Uh, it is disappointing that we can't meet 
uh, in person because a lot of the fun of these summer schools is the interaction. Uh, the, the, uh, the discussions tend to be very lively. We'll try to have a lively discussion today, but uh, it's harder to do it on Zoom. So uh, if, if you haven't participated in a live summer school before, let me encourage you to, uh, to come uh, because it, 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 it's better than this. Okay, what I thought I would do, this is, this is uh, something of an introductory lecture. Uh, all I plan to do uh, in this talk is to show you that there are some simple ideas from mechanism design, which, um, which are relevant for emergencies uh, like pandemics. Uh, I don't think uh, much of the theory itself in, in this talk is going to be particularly original, but uh, the application perhaps is, is a bit unusual. So, um, so let me start. Uh, I think um, those of us who have been studying economics for a long time would all agree that most of the time markets, competitive markets uh, do a, a good job of allocating scarce resources to, uh, to where they should go. Uh, the, the market is an amazingly powerful resource allocation mechanism. And, and, an, and an amazingly efficient one. Uh, and just to review the market's power, let's, let's look at a, at a simple model uh, of a single good. So, so, so imagine there are many consumers, many producers of some good will, uh, will uh, attach benefit BI of XI, to quantity XI of the goods. So BI is consumer I's benefit, gross benefits from consuming a quantity XI of the good. Uh, now, in order to produce a quantity YJ, producer J has to incur a cost, uh, CJ of YJ. So the these benefits and costs are all going to be denominated in, in money. Let's uh, then write the, the net social benefits from all of these consumers consuming their XIs and all of these producers producing their YJs as the sum of the benefits minus the sum of the costs. Here, uh, implicitly, I'm making some assumptions about uh, quasi-linearity of consumers' utilities. Now, if we want an efficient outcome, an optimal outcome, then uh, explicitly or implicitly, uh, we as the uh, social planners say, are interested in maximizing net so social benefits subject to the constraints on this market, which first of all are uh, Supply, this is total supply uh, equals total demand. Uh, and notice that involved in this maximization are in effect several optimizations. So, so first of all, when we solve this problem, we have to get the sum of the YJs, the, 
the, the total production right. We also have to get each individual producer's production YJ right. And we have to get each individual consumer's consumption right. Uh, so that looks pretty complicated. Uh, there are a lot of different quantities which have to be at exactly the right level. Nevertheless, a price system, a market system, uh, solves these many uh, choices uh, in an efficient way. The, the, the competitive market uh, does this straightforwardly through prices. Uh, so let, let P be the market price of, of this good, which is being bought and sold. Uh, and now uh, each consumer will be maximizing her her net benefit, which is gross benefit B of XI minus the cost of XI, which is P XI, the cost to her. Uh, and that means that uh, assuming differentiability, uh, this first order condition for maximization must hold. The, the marginal benefit has to equal the price. Uh, each producer maximizes its profit, uh, which is the, the revenue from selling uh, YJ units of outputs, uh, price times quantity, minus the cost of that production. And once again, there's a, uh, there's a first order condition associated uh, with that maximization, price equals marginal cost. And so we see that the, the uh, what we want to attain is optimization of net social benefit subject to supply equals demand. Uh, but in fact, the competitive market uh, does exactly that because uh, when when price adjusts to equate supply and demand, all the for, all the first order conditions for this optimization uh, will hold, and price here ends up simply being a Lagrange multiplier uh, on the supply equals demand constraint. So all of this is all of this is familiar to uh, to people who have studied some some price theory. Uh, but what I'm mostly interested in today uh, is uh, well, what if there if there is no existing market, and yet we need to come up with some good right away. It's an emergency, it's a pandemic. Um, and furthermore, what if the good that is needed is not purely a private good, it's also a public good in the sense that if people have it, they will be conferring benefits on other people. Uh, well, a good example of such a good is a coronavirus test. Early in the pandemic, before there was a vaccine, uh, the only way that you could tell whether it was safe to interact fairly closely with a person was to know that that person uh, was not infected. And, and so uh, an, an important part of the response to the pandemic was producing many, many 
millions and millions of coronavirus test kits. Uh, now, because this was a, a new virus, a test kit for this exact good had not been produced before. There, there was not already a market for this, uh, for this good. Uh, there, there were some firms around that had produced similar products for, for other viruses, but not this exact good. And yet it was important to uh, not only create a market for this good, but to do so really fast. Now, what, the, what a country or a government could do in, some, some, it, 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 in circumstances like these is simply to leave everything to the market. And, and um, we know that uh, ultimately we'll, we'll, we'll get something out of the market. Uh, suppliers will produce the test kits, consumers uh, or hospitals or employers will buy test kits from suppliers. Uh, but um, we, um, we don't expect the market to, to work perfectly uh, in these circumstances. Uh, first of all, uh, we're talking about a good which hasn't existed before. It's a new good. Uh, when a supplier is contemplating how much to produce, it faces some uncertainty because uh, it, there's, no, there's not yet a prevailing price to guide uh, that supplier. So uh, we may worry that there'll be delays in supply because suppliers are reluctant to jump in when there is uncertainty about the price that they're going to get. We're also, and, 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 and one of the reasons why suppliers may be reluctant is because uh, whatever, whatever these test kits end up looking like, there, there may be large setup costs uh, that have to be incurred uh, to produce them. Now, of course, ultimately we might expect the, the market to resolve these uncertainties. There'll be some equilibration process where perhaps prices will start out high when demand is high and supply is low, uh, and then ultimately come down, uh, but, uh, but we don't wanna wait around for that equilibration process uh, to occur. Uh, we, need, we need these test kits now. Uh, and another problem with the solution is that, uh, especially at first, we might expect uh, prices to be very high because suppliers are only beginning to enter this market, uh, demand is very high, uh, and that's not that's not so good for large segments of society, poorer consumers who perhaps can't afford the uh, the high prices. It's also bad from the standpoint of the public good aspect of the good. Remember, um, a test kit is valuable not just to the, to the uh, person who, who, who gets the test, but also to uh, all the people uh, he associates with. So, so there, it's, it's very much a, a, a public good, uh, or at least in, in, to, to a large extent, a public good. And therefore, uh, if you rely on consumers themselves to buy these test kits, it's likely that they're not going to buy enough of them relative to the, to the social optimum. 
So, so these are all reasons why uh, a pure market solution to the provision of test kits in a pandemic uh, may not be the way to go. So let's, um, let's consider another solution. Um, and, and, and this was actually used, this was used in the, in the United States under a, a law which gives the, uh, the government the power in an emergency to actually order producers to uh, produce certain goods. I don't, I don't think this was done with test kits, but it was done with ventilators. Um, so the government picks some potential suppliers and tells them that they, they have to produce the test kits uh, now. The, this, by contrast with a uh, market solution, is a, a command economy solution, the, the sort of thing that was done in the, in the Soviet Union. Uh, Well, this might get you test kits quickly, but it, it also has its problems. Uh, for example, which suppliers are going to be ordered to produce the test kits? Uh, governments may not be in a position to know suppliers' production costs, so uh, if it picks supplier A, well, it may turn out that supplier B could have produced them uh, much more cheaply. Uh, and in fact, the, since we're talking about a new good, a good that hasn't been produced before, the government may not even know who all of the potential suppliers are. Uh, and then the government has to figure out, well, how many test kits uh, should be produced? That also depends on, on costs, which the government doesn't know. Uh, and how do these costs get covered? Uh, in, a, in a market economy, they, in effect, get covered automatically through the equilibration process. But uh, we're talking here about a command economy. So uh, command economies, uh, can be used and, and, and they have the virtue of being uh, quick, but uh, they have the disadvantage of being uh, really quite inefficient. So I'm going to give you a, a sort of intermediate solution, uh, which is provided by uh, mechanism design. Uh, and the government will play a big role uh, for each potential supplier. The government is in effect going to commit to a price it will pay for a specified amount of the, of the test kits. Uh, and, and, and that will give the supplier the certainty it needs in order to, to go ahead with production. This will, this will resolve the, the supplier's uncertainty. And then after the government has, has uh, made this commitment and the supplier has actually produced, the government will turn around and resell the test kits at a low price, a price that uh, even poorer consumers can afford, uh, perhaps the government will even uh, give, the, uh, give the goods away. And in, in, in the case of vaccines in the US, uh, consumers have not been paying for those vaccines uh, themselves. Uh, but then, of course, the question arises, uh, what price and what quantity should the government be committing to? Uh, and to 
see how to answer that question, let's let's start with the case uh, of a single supplier. Let, let's imagine that there's only one potential supplier for the test kits uh, and see how the solution works in that case. Well, what the government first needs to figure out uh, is well, what are these uh, what are these test kits worth to society? Uh, so it, it it will devise some schedule, some function b of y, where b is the gross social benefits of having y test kits uh, available. And this, th this can be done uh, partly on medical grounds. It can be done partly on the basis of uh, consumer preferences. However, however the government wants to do it, it comes up with this schedule. Uh, and then it tells the support the government tells the supplier, well, um, for each, uh, if, if you end up producing Y test kits, we will pay you B of Y. So, so the government, uh, in this case, actually leaves it up to the producer how much to produce. The, the, the government is giving the, so the producer a, a, a schedule of prices, schedule of payment. So uh, the, the producer can do the optimization uh, itself. Now, let's suppose that the, that the, Producer's production function is, is C of Y. Then the producer will be solving this problem, max B of Y minus C of Y. This is the amount that it's being paid. This is the amount that it has to, the, the cost that it has to incur. Uh, but notice that what the supplier is maximizing is in fact net social benefits. And so indeed it will choose a supply which is optimal from the standpoint of society. What we're using here is a very simple idea, but a very powerful idea uh, in, 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 in mechanism design, which is that if you've, if you've got uh, agents who don't inherently share the social objective, well, you can adjust their object objectives by appropriate transfers so that in fact, they end up having the same objective as society. And that's what, that's what we've done here. The supplier may not care about society per se, but by giving, giving the supplier this objective function, uh, you get it to behave as though it's optimizing society's objective function. Okay, well, it, in, in this um, one supplier case, uh, everything is extremely simple. There, there is one problem with the solution, of course, which is that uh, the supplier is getting the entire uh, net social surplus. Uh, that, that, doesn't seem, uh, that doesn't seem right. Uh, after all, the, the, these test kits are supposed to be produced for the benefit of society. Why should they 
why should the producer be getting all the surplus? Now, that can be taken care of to some extent by adjusting the payment to the, to the supplier. Instead of paying the supplier B of Y, we can pay the supplier B of Y minus some con constant K. Uh, adding or subtracting a constant from the payment uh, is clearly not going to affect the supplier's maximization problem. So it will still choose the right outputs. Uh, the problem with this modification though, is that uh, from the government's point of view, it may not be clear um, how to choose K in a, uh, in a, in an optimal way. Uh, if, K, if K is too small, well, then, it, then the supplier is still going to get most of the, most of the surplus. Uh, and, uh, and that's not good. Uh, on the other hand, if, if K is chosen to be too big, well, then the supplier may, uh, may not be able to cover its costs at all and refuse to supply. So, so we can't, uh, so the government has to worry about what K is. It's not clear unless the government knows a fair amount about the supplier's costs, which we're assuming it doesn't know, uh, unless it did know something about costs, it, it might be um, difficult for it to choose K. So, so having a, a single supplier uh, is not a uh, is is not a great circumstance. But what we'll see is that if there's um, if there's some competition among suppliers, if there are multiple suppliers, uh, then uh, we we may well be able to get. Uh, the payments down uh, to a uh, tolerable level. So that's what I want to turn to uh, next, how we overcome um, the, uh, the, the distribution of surplus problem through competition. So now let's suppose that there are uh, multiple potential suppliers. And, and each, um, each has a cost function as before. Uh, and ju just to make matters simple, let's suppose that all of these suppliers are gonna be producing uh, equivalent test kits. Um, this actually isn't essential for the argument, but it, it, it simplifies matters to suppose that one supplier's test kit is, is in effect uh, the same as any other. So the, the gross social benefits uh, is of the, the sum of uh, the individual supplies. It, 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 it's over total supply. And so now the government is interested in maximizing the uh, gross benefit from total supply minus the costs of production, just, just as before. So this is the social objective function. Um, but of, of course, in Pursuing this maximization, it, 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 it's facing the same uh, informational problem uh, that it has uh, in, in, these, in these past examples. It doesn't know uh, the supplier's cost functions. In fact, as I was 
suggesting before, it may not even know who all the potential suppliers even are. So what it can do is to, uh, to make a call for test kits. What it, it'll say, we, we would like to have test kits produced. Uh, and if you are interested in potentially producing uh, test kits, uh, tell us uh, what your cost function is. So, so each firm will report a cost function. Of course, there's nothing to force a firm to report its true cost function. It could, it could report anything it wanted. And then once these cost functions have been uh, sent to the government, the government can uh, compute the supplies that maximize apparent net surplus. Of course, it doesn't know that these costs are, are the true costs, but let but it proceeds as though these are the true costs. Uh, and then it tells each firm what uh, quantity that firm should produce according to this maximization. So, so firm K is told, well, you should produce YK star because YK star is part of the solution uh, to this maximization. And here is the, the critical part. Here, here is the mechanism design part. This, this is what the firm is paid. Uh, it's paid the difference between uh, two expressions. Let's, let's look at this expression first, the, the, the expression in the first pair of square brackets. Firm K is, is paid uh, the apparent gross social benefits as before in the monopoly case, minus the costs that the other firms, the firms J not equal to K are incurring to, in order to produce uh, their part of the allocation. So that's the first pair of square brackets. Now let's look at uh, the second pair of square brackets. Here, we're imagining that firm K didn't exist at all. Uh, and the government is redoing the op optimization, assuming that firm K is out of the picture and, and is just optimizing uh, using the, the remaining firms. So, so this second square bracket is the net social optimum with firm K out of the picture. So what, so what we have here is firm K is in effect being paid its marginal effects on the rest of society. That this is what society gets in net. If K is there, this is what society gets in net if firm K is not there. And, and, and that's what firm K is paid. Uh, well, some of you may recognize this as a variant of a classic mechanism design uh, mechanism called the VCG, the Vickrey Clark Groves mechanism. And, and, and 
I've just applied that idea to a setting uh, where there, there are two stages of communication. There's a stage where firms report cost functions, and then there's a stage where government report, tells each firm how much to produce and pays them uh, accordingly. Uh, but the, uh, the nice thing about this mechanism is uh, first, it will indeed pay each firm to report its costs truthfully uh, because uh, look at this expression here, the, the, the second square brackets contain nothing that depends on firm K. Firm K is out of the picture here. So, so, so this expression doesn't affect firm K's maximization at all. And as for this expression, well, it's just net social benefit but not including firm K's costs. If we subtract off firm K's costs from, from this expression here, firm K is simply maximizing once again, the net social benefit. And so of course it will choose when it's reporting CK, star to, cho to, to choose the truthful cost schedule. Uh, so we get to the social optimum and furthermore, because firm K is only being paid its marginal impact on society, uh, firm K, Need not be uh, need not be paid very much at all. Uh, in fact, let let let's let's look um, let's look at a simple example. Suppose that there were just two firms, uh, and let's look at a at a uh, benefit function that is quadratic in the two firms' outputs. Let's say the two firms have, have linear costs. Mar marginal, marginal cost is a constant. Well, in that case, because costs are linear, either supplier, could in principle supply the entire market efficiently. And that means that if either firm is excluded from the economy, uh, and, and that's the exercise we do in, in calculating how much each is paid, if, e if either supplier is excluded, the other can supply the entire market efficiently. And that means that the excluded firm isn't even needed. Its marginal impact is zero. And that means that in an example like this, even though there are just two firms, the only thing suppliers are going to get is, is recouping their costs. They're, they're not going to make any positive profit at all. And this illustrates the idea that uh, not only can we get to the social optimum using a, uh, a, a simple BCG mechanism, but we can also in many circumstances ensure that no firm, no supplier is going to be getting uh, uh, unacceptably high payoffs. Uh, in, in, in this case, uh, they, they make no, no positive profit at all. They just recoup their costs. Uh, 
Um, might be good if I if I pause just for a moment to make sure that uh, there aren't any questions. Elhanan, is there is there anything uh, in the chat that we should yeah, know Jerry, about? There was a question which you might want to defer to the end um, that came up all, already when you talked about a single firm, and that is the idea of nationalizing the supplier. Um, so that is uh, a, one question. Um, now the the Two other questions. Um, aren't you concerned about an additional equilibrium where no one produces in the example? And how do you account for firms' limited production capacities? Okay, let 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 me let me uh, talk about the the uh, the second and third questions uh, first, because they're, they're, uh, they're the easiest. So uh, one nice feature of the Vickery Clark Groves mechanism is that it's not only uh, an equilibrium best response, for firms to report their cost functions truthfully. It's a dominant strategy. So, so even regardless of what other firms do, you want to report your true costs. And that means that and, and that means that there is no second equilibrium where firms don't produce. There, there, there's a unique equilibrium which maximizes the social optimum. Now, now on the question of uh, on, on the question of capacity constraints. Well, though those actually are implicit in the cost functions. So, so suppose that a, a, a firm can't produce more than 50 test kits. Well, that means in effect that marginal cost is, is very high or, or even infinite uh, beyond, beyond that point. So, so implicit in, in, in this model, uh, we have in fact captured, uh, we have in fact, captured uh, capacity constraints. Uh, now, uh, a, a more complicated question is uh, the case of nationalization. Uh, what if the government simply uh, took over the, uh, the firms that, uh, that could produce test kits? Uh, well, there, there, there's an immediate problem uh, that I already alluded to with, with nationalization is that the, the government may not even know, since this is a new good, the government may not even know who all the relevant suppliers are. Uh, and that's going to interfere with rational uh, with nationalization because how can you take someone over if you don't know who they are? Uh, but um, even um, even if it could identify all the potential suppliers and take uh, take them over, um, running an industry um, is a is a big job. At, at the time of a pandemic, government has other matters on its mind besides running the industry for test kits. So uh, 
yes, I, we, we certainly do have historical examples of industries that have been nationalized temporarily uh, or sometimes permanently. Uh, but uh, whenever you nationalize your, whenever a government nationalizes, it, it's taking on a much bigger job than simply doing the optimizations in the Vickery Clark Groves mechanism. And perhaps, perhaps this bigger job it, uh, is something that the government might want to avoid. Okay, let, let me go on. I have one more uh, thing I want to do, and then we can have some more questions, uh, unless there's something urgent now. Is there anything or more that I should do now? No, no, I suggest you proceed. Suggest okay. You. Okay, I've been, I've been assuming that each supplier um, can supply uh, its good without any uncertainty uh, in, um, in production. Uh, notice that there were no, no probabilities involved in, in uh, any of these expressions. Uh, but uh, if the good in question requires um, a significant amount of innovation, then assuming there's no uncertainty is, is probably not a good assumption. And, and there, there have been many debates over the years on the extent to which governments should get involved in innovation. Uh, actually, I noticed over the weekend that uh, uh, Anne Krieger has, has just written a piece for uh, project, project syndicates uh, suggesting that, uh, reminding us that government doesn't always do innovation uh, very well. Uh, and and, and there, there's a, an obvious reason why we, we might want government to stay out of innovation, which is that there's no particular reason to suppose that government will even know what the innovation policies are. After all, uh, when we think of a creative inventor, we, we think of the inventor as imagining what might be possible. There's no, uh, there's no particular reason why the, the government should know what these possibilities are too. Uh, and in fact, uh, in recent American history, there, there have been some particularly embarrassing cases where the government made a, a guess about what kind of innovation to support, and it turned out uh, poorly. There, there, were, there was a case uh, uh, in the Obama administration of a of a solar cell manufacturer. It was a new way of producing solar cells called Solyndra, uh, and it ended up losing uh, a lot of money for the, uh, for the governments. So there, there's at least some hesitancy uh, uh, in the minds of many economists uh, on how involved in innovation, directly involved in innovation government should be. Uh, but there, there, there are some important exceptions uh, because sometimes the government at least has a good idea of what the goal of innovation should be. They, they may not know how the innovation is going to be accomplished, what the technology is going to be, but they know what they, they, they know what the product of innovation should do. And, and uh, a famous historical case uh, of this 
was in the 18th century um, when it was considered critically important to be able for ships to be able to calculate longitude. If a ship is crossing the ocean, it needs to know its latitude, that is its distance from its uh, horizontal distance from the equator. Uh, and it has to know its longitude, which is its vertical distance from, uh, from the prime meridian. Uh, now, actually, latitude had always been easy to determine. Uh, to figure out how far you are from the equator, you look at the position of the sun at its highest most point in the sky, and you look at the angle that the sun makes with a line going uh, straight up. And, and that tells you uh, latitude. Uh, but longitude was, was a much harder problem. In the 18th century, uh, that could not be calculated accurately. And, and, and that was a disaster uh, for, for shipping. So uh, in fact, the British governments put up a large sum of money to any inventor who could solve the latitude problem to a specified degree of accuracy. Uh, so it's a well-defined problem for, for inventors. Uh, and in fact, there were a lot of inventors who got into the act and they used different ideas. What some were astronomical, that is uh, looking at the position of the stars or, or actually even the position of the moons of Jupiter um, others um, involved um, chronometers, that is, uh, if you knew that it, it was uh, noon in London, uh, then, and, and, and you could look at, at the position of the sun now, that would allow you to tell you how far in a uh, longitudinal uh, sense you were from, from London. Uh, and and that, it was the chronometer solution that uh, ended up uh, solving the problem. Uh, John Harrison uh, built an accurate enough watch to, uh, to solve the problem. And this had an enormous effect on, on sea travel. It made it safer, uh, more efficient. Now, there's another way of rewarding innovation rather than simply putting up prizes as in the longitude case, and that is to award patents uh, to successful inventors. So a prize is, a, is an ex ante uh, reward. You, you say uh, in advance, this is how much you will get if you succeed. In the case of a patent, there, there are no promises made. Uh, if it turns out that what you come up with is valuable, the market will, will buy it uh, and what we're going to do is to protect you from competition. If you make the invention, you get a monopoly on it uh, for at least uh, uh, a certain length of time. For some reason, my uh, slides froze for, for a moment. So you get a monopoly profit for. Uh, for some number of years. Uh, and patents and prizes uh, have their uh, drawbacks and advantages. One, one drawback to the uh, patent system is that you're, you are awarding a monopoly. And so uh, again, a lot of the benefits 
of your invention is going to accrue to the inventor rather than to the, to the society the invention was created for. Uh, one advantage of awarding a prize for solving the longitude problem is that the invention is not monopolized. It, it immediately goes into the uh, public domain and everybody can use it. And yet the, the inventor is rewarded through the prize. So recently we, we've had the example of these, uh, of these COVID vaccines. Uh, and uh, actually Mike, Michael Kramer, who's going to be speaking next, is, I think is going to be talking uh, a lot more about this. So I, I'm just gonna make a few comments. Uh, in, in the US, the, there was this program called Operation Warp Speed, uh, which was an interesting combination of uh, prizes, patents, and also um, upfront investment by government. So, so government uh, came in before the vaccines had been created and said, and, 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 and in effect subsidized the production costs. Uh, and so that, that mechanism seems to have worked uh, quite well. Uh, and I think Michael will go into detail on that. Uh, vaccines were, were developed quickly. Um, we have been running into some trouble uh, now, now that uh, vaccines are, are needed in uh, low income countries uh, with the fact that these are patent protected, how, how, how are the low income countries going to get these patents for, uh, get, get these vaccines for uh, a reasonable price? Uh, so, so I think it, it's worth looking at how the uh, vaccine innovation could have been done uh, under a pure prize system. Uh, so that, th th this is a, a thought experiment rather than uh, uh, a replication of what actually was done. So let's imagine that there are two drug companies, two pharma companies who could possibly develop this vaccine, COVID vaccine, uh, and uh, let's suppose that uh, if firm I produces it uh, alone, uh, the social benefit is, is BI. Uh, it's funny that my slides are frozen again. Let's suppose that if they both produce it, there'll be a, uh, a social benefit uh, B12. Uh, once again, uh, there'll be cost functions. Now we should think of these cost functions as the cost of succeeding with probability PI. So, so if, if, if firm I uh, puts more resources into the vaccine, it can raise the probability of success, maybe not to one or even anything close to one, but it, 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 by varying PI and 
and incurring more costs as PI goes up, uh, it, the firm can increase the probability of success. So that, that, that is the uh, PI is the, is the figure to be maximized. Uh, it, it, it's the maximizing choice uh, in, in this problem. So the, the net social benefits now looks like this. Uh, if, if both firms succeed, which is P1 times P2, that's the probability of success, uh, then social benefit is B1, two. If just firm one succeeds, which happens with probability P1 times one minus P2, then benefit is B1 uh, and so on. And we subtract off from gross expected uh, gross social benefit, the, uh, the costs of obtaining these probabilities. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm assuming that the that the probability of discovery is independent across the two firms, but that can easily be modified. Uh, so suppose that firm one uh, is offered these uh, these numbers that I had on the previous slide. It's offered B1 if it succeeds by itself and its marginal impacts on society if they both succeed. So this is what happens if both firm one and firm two have succeeded. This is what happens if just firm two succeeds. So firm one is being paid its marginal impact uh, and it gets nothing if it doesn't succeed. So this, this is a pure prize uh, scheme. And in fact, it will induce firm one to choose the socially optimal, uh, the, the socially optimal probability. Uh, and similarly for firm two. And furthermore, uh, if, there's, if there's a good chance that both firms will succeed, that both uh, Moderna and Pfizer uh, will succeed, uh, then uh, in fact, both those companies uh, don't end up getting uh, an overwhelmingly high uh, payoff. They just get their marginal, uh, the, the, their marginal contributions to society. Uh, now, as I said, I, we, we can modify this calculation uh, if there is a correlation between the firms. Uh, we can also, so, so I've been assuming that firms are uh, calculating their, uh, their expected monetary benefits. That, that assumes risk neutrality. Of, of course, there's good reason to assume in a circumstance like this, where there are billions of dollars at stake, that firms might be risk averse. That, can, that we can adjust by scaling up the, um, the size of the, 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 the size of the prizes, uh, the, make the prizes bigger. Uh, one problem, however, with, with, with doing things through a pure prize mechanism in the case of something enormous like vaccines is that the, the social value is truly huge of having a vaccine, as we've seen. Um, and so uh, uh, prizes could be very large. And, and, and uh, if there's risk aversion, they're going, as I was saying, they're going to have to be even bigger. Uh, so that might run up against all sorts of political constraints. If, if, if the pharma companies are seen to be getting these huge prizes, uh, that um, may not be politically or even morally tolerable. And so uh, that suggests 
uh, that it may be important, in a, perhaps in addition to giving prizes, to also covering the upfront costs that innovators have to make. And uh, I believe Michael will be getting into that more. Um, that is all I have to say, though. So, uh, so let me stop there. And maybe we, if there are any more questions, perhaps we could spend a couple of minutes on those. Uh, El Elkanen, you're muted. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> no, Eric, the only question that, that came up uh, on the chat uh, is actually, is, is a point you just referred to, and namely the effect of risk aversion. Right. Um, but, uh, I mean, let, well, let, let, you, let me you, just... you discuss this, but so <laughs> if you want yeah. to add something. Uh, well, let, uh, I, I don't have anything to add, but let me just repeat. If firms are risk averse, then it may not be enough to give them these prizes because a risk averse utility function will in effect move down the payoff from uh, a very high prize like this. So in order to count, if you were, if you were going to have a pure prize scheme as, as they did for longitude, you would have to scale these numbers up even higher. But that, would, that might be politically impossible. It might, be, uh, it, 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 it might not be tolerable for society to, pe to pay uh, Pfizer a trillion dollars uh, if Pfizer is the only company to succeed. So an alternative strategy, and, and this was in fact used, uh, I, I believe that as, as Michael Kramer will, will say, is uh, for the government not to uh, just offer a prize, but also to heavily subsidize the costs, the innovation costs themselves. And that, that will bring down the, uh, the, the need to give very high prizes. Um, Eric, another question uh, or two that came up is whether mechanisms of the type you described were actually used. So that was one question. And another question is, uh, what happens when the supplier doesn't know his uh, CP function, namely doesn't know if what costs would come with, what cost would generate what probability of success? Right. Uh, so let, let, let me take that second question. Um, so I, I, I've, we've been assuming, even though there's uncertainty about whether the vaccine will be developed, that at least the firm knows um, the probabilities uh, of of success for different levels of uh, effort that the firm can make, uh, but maybe it, maybe it doesn't even know that. So, it, it, in other words, maybe um, maybe uh, this cost function is itself a stochastic function. Uh, so, so there's a probability distribution over costs. Uh, well, that, that's, that's not going to change the analysis um, as long as firms are risk neutral, uh, because any, any uncertainty about cost can just be expected out. Just uh, this is an expectation. We can also introduce uncertainty about the seas and that that's fine, 
Um, if firms are risk averse, of course, the uncertainty about costs uh, does have to, d d does really matter um, and introduces an, an additional element of risk, uh, which is an additional reason why uh, government might want to get involved ex ante and not just ex post, ex ante in the sense of helping the firm uh, with, those, with those costs. Uh, then someone was asking about whether uh, mechanism design has been used. Well, mechanism design has been used in many, many places. Um, it, it, was, it, was sort, it was sort of used uh, for vaccines uh, as, as I, uh, you know, well, my, I, I, again, Michael might be the, uh, the right one to, to go into that, but uh, Michael and other people uh, Susan Athey, who, who are mechanism design experts, uh, were heavily involved in the discussion about what the government should do and what the government ended up doing, I think, reflected uh, that discussion. So uh, mechanism design ideas certainly played an important role with vaccines, um, which Michael, I think, will tell you more about. Okay, Eric, thank you very much. Uh, we will take now uh, a break and at 5.30, uh, Michael will, uh, will start his lecture. Thank you very much. Eric. And, and that'll be 10.30 in, in, uh, in Boston. <laughs> yes. Okay, see you. And 10.30 uh, Eastern time, yeah. Right. Okay, okay thank see, you. See you soon, thank you. Thank you.